animation in general has often struggled against the rather ignorant view that it's for children. While Ray Harryhausen's Dynamation was a term to describe his particular style of special effects animations, the name was really just a marketing term created by his production partner, Charles Schneer, to evade those negative connotations. The audience being both ignorant and stupid. <laughs> Things were rather different in Eastern Europe, though, and the likes of Yeezy Trinka uh, were making animated films specifically for adult audiences. And it's with the Czech legend that we start, and his 1959 film, Sena Noche Swatajansky, or in English, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Take it away, Scott. Yes, uh, Trinka is, I must confess, not an artist I was familiar with until researching this episode, by which I mean a rough Google search. So <laughs> I'm going to assume that his description as the Walt Disney of Eastern Europe means a storied and respected career dedicated to illustration, animations, and naturally directing the stop-motion work inspired by the Shakespeare piece, rather than being a weirdo that took far too much acclaim, rightly due to people doing the actual work and also ruining the copyright system forever. Although, according to that Google search, he was actually much more interested in the creation of the public it's used in his work rather than the animation itself which was handled by a team of animators so perhaps it's not that far off now uh, as mentioned this is an adaptation of a midsummer's night stream this is intended to be more like a ballet performance than a stage play with a heavy focus on Vaclav trojan's music and with some narration to explain things a little and i should say that this was the czech version we watched as going by the cast list on an english language version uh, there must have been a very differently dubbed approach to taken for that and why i point this out alongside the adjunct fact that I've never read A Midsummer's Night Dream is to say that I'm not 100% clear on what was going on in this film <laughs> or why it was going on. And for this I am thankful because I've often wondered what it must have been like to watch David Lynch's adaptation of June without having read the book first and it's probably approximate to the level of confusion and wonder that I felt during this. As such, I shan't attempt to recap the four interconnecting romance plots with the diversions to Fairyland thanks Wikipedia, of the original that I presume are present in this and instead I'll just appreciate the spectacle of the striking character designs, the intricate animation, and Vaclav Trojan's compositions. I'm not sure I'd recommend this to anyone that doesn't already have a working knowledge of the source material. Uh, my apologies for being an uncultured oaf, uh, but it's a striking film that shouldn't take the fall for my ignorance. Uh, Drew, did you make anything of this? This was... Uh... Oh, I'm going to talk about the Shakespeare part of it first. I have never either seen an adaptation of Midsummer Night's Dream but I've I've seen enough bits and pieces and heard enough bits and pieces about it and even things like university challenge questions about <laughs> Shakespeare that I know the general gist of it and that didn't help at all because I <laughs> yeah. wasn't sure why anything was happening what um, what, what is quite striking about it though really is the production design mm -hmm. it's it doesn't look like a, like many stop motion animations I've seen, and in some ways it's certainly more simplistic. the The faces in particular, uh, they don't move and they look mm. ridiculous, and I didn't care for them at all. So I was actually quite surprised to find that his puppets were particularly well regarded for their faces, and that that was his big focus. And I'm, I'm watching this like. it's just got two big silly eyes and to um, Oberon, uh, and they never <laughs> moved. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, it's quite striking. It's really interesting design. There's some really nice sections. And unfortunately, I only have a standard definition version. And I think it would, it, it's yeah. suffering a bit from that rather lower definition transfer because there are moments where Titania, for instance, the Queen of the Fairies, is moving around with this train of individually animated fairies. Yeah. Like tiny little things behind her. And like that's fantastic, but I, I really couldn't fully really appreciate it. Yeah. Because of the quality of the materials, which is a pity. So there's clearly a lot of talent there. And the thing is, I do think that it is relying on people already knowing the story, though, because the narrate it's whereas the English language voice version you mentioned, Scott, has a narration by Richard Burton, but has all of the roles played. Yes. The yeah. Czech version only has a narration. Yeah, and a fairly sparing narration at that. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> whether it's hoping that the action itself will will be the interpretation of the story and you can follow along, or whether it's hoping or assuming that its audience is quite Shakespeare literate, yeah. I, I don't know, but I think it suffers a bit for that. Whereas it worries that maybe the, the English language version might go too far the other way. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't particularly enjoy it, but 
there are certainly there are things in there that I found of merit, and the, there is for. And if you've seen a picture of Easy Trinka, he is a miserable, miserable looking man. Um, which is quite strange that you've spent his life in something yeah. as um, so kind of inconsequential, really, as animation. Uh, yeah, it looks somewhere between Ron Swanson and Rip Torn, I think. <laughs> With a stomach ache. Uh, <laughs> he's, um, I mean, I, admittedly, I've seen a picture of him but uh, if it's a representative picture then it's uh, it wouldn't look like the happiest person to be around but there is clearly humour in here and I know there's a lot of humour in Shakespeare so some of it may be like based on that but yeah there's uh, at the beginning when Puck gets sent to the island to get the flower that makes people fall in love with each other yeah and the way like with even just like there's some bits like Puck standing with his hands behind his back like that's clearly um, done for human it works really well yeah. and then when the the sheep gets enamoured of him with the rose it's like <laughs> yeah. that's actually genuinely funny so there yeah. is some kind of lighter stuff in there uh, yeah I like the little, little visual gags with the uh, statues falling in love as well and yeah that was yeah. Cool. yeah. So, yes um, I think Shakespeare can sometimes seem really heavy going and I, I've always wondered whether it has been just like find it so miserable at school but I've never really enjoyed Shakespeare very much yeah I think I've got the same thing where I, I was kind of forced to read it at school at some point and it put yeah, me off the experience put me off it almost for life and yeah, I, that's exactly it's not it, fair sorry. but I should go back to it at some point yeah um, and, and I'm aware of how incredibly influential it is not just the English speaking world but mm. everywhere there's a reason that it was done in um, Czechoslovakia as was but it's just, uh, I don't know, I wasn't particularly engaged by the story and I don't know if that's because of the Shakespeare thing or not, but some of the set design is really interesting and what obviously I think actually it probably shouldn't have much more than a narration is that it's clearly inspired by ballet. It's meant to be a like a balletic interpretation rather than yeah. a, a dramatic one, yeah. rather than a, an acting one. Uh, and again... I don't care much for Bali either. So, uh, you know, there's not an awful lot here for me. Yeah. But there are some really interesting sequences where there is, like, they've made these little stop motion puppets do quite nice Bali moves and stuff. And when you're doing it in the, the late 50s, you know, it's with yeah. considerably less technology available at the time. I'm quite impressed by that. So it's, it's certainly, um, and I know actually stop motion animation goes back to the very early days of cinema. Um, although, tends to be more shorts then it's from a historical point of view of uh animation form i absolutely love it's interesting at least yeah i mean there's a definite sliding scale of um well both budget and technical um capacity that is available to these films as we go on if we're doing this chronologically so taking into account the time it was made in it is quite remarkable uh, at the level of detail it's done even things like uh, there's a there's a scene where uh, one of the guards kind of loses his either his shield or his helmet and is kind of chasing it around trying to pick it up and it's just lots of lovely little intricate bits of things that even these days would take days and days to animate uh, but it's even greater to appreciate it just given the the kind of level of technology when you know what it's going to be sitting in rather than being sitting in front of what's effectively a DSLR for some of the later films we'll get to um, as opposed to say a large um, a rather larger construct that we've been dealing with back in the 50s so yeah there's a lot of um, technical hurdles that would have had to be overcome to get to this level of um, intricacy with the movements and the details that I can appreciate but yeah I'm pretty much on the same page as you are with the, uh, the actual story as it's hard to get into the story when you don't know it and it's not really explaining it all that well <laughs> yes. so yeah um, it requires a bit of um, previous work to properly enjoy this I think which is perhaps unusual given that you'd, you'd probably expect stop motion to be marketed mainly at kids and they're not going to get this unless they've read yeah. a Midsummer Night's Dream before then so yeah uh, definitely one for an adult audience that's actually read the source material first and they might get something more about it than I, than I did uh, but yeah I can, I can appreciate all the technical elements on board this but yeah hard to recommend anyone that doesn't know what they're getting, getting into in the first place yeah it's certainly quite opaque but just to echo what you said I've got thinking. I've watched this and I'm thinking about the fact that yeah they're trying to do like single shot of time with film camera, a lot trickier to do than with like, the modern way, which is just using a stills camera. Yeah. Digital or otherwise, that's an awful lot easier. Yeah. Uh, and then like one of the key difficulties of stop motion animation, because it is so spread out, because it takes so long, is keeping lighting consistent. Yeah. 
And I'm thinking, like, again, I mentioned something similar the last time we talked about a Czech film, which was uh, Tomorrow I'll Wake Up and Scald Myself with Tea. Yeah. But certainly in the West, we have this idea that technology and things weren't that great in the Eastern Bloc, in, particularly in the 1950s. And certainly I have this idea that the electricity supply and various other things, you know, probably <laughs> weren't that steady. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how accurate that is. That's the impression I have from having lived in the West for my entire life. But I'm like in 1950s Czechoslovakia, when they have to keep the lighting really consistent over months and months to do this, like, that must have been quite a, a achievement to a hard to overcome if I'm accurate thinking that that was, you know, not yeah. necessarily something you could rely on. <laughs> yeah. If you can't rely on consistent uh, power in California, <laughs> yeah, you know, and then now, <laughs> so... But yeah, uh, it's really interesting. And you see it's that a lot of stop motion is that, uh, directed towards children, it certainly is. But fear not, dear listener, in this film, in this podcast, we have at least one particular film very much not aimed at children. Um, and oh, yes. we will we'll be giving um, quite a, a range of things here. 